Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Andrew Smith, the executive director of ADSO. Um, thank you for joining. Uh, this is our first, as Lily mentioned, ADSO exchange, which is, I think, a really exciting opportunity here at the association as we're really thinking about how do we uh, collaborate further with our industry partners, um, you know, specifically those at the champion level. As Lily mentioned, we're going to be having about a dozen webinars throughout the year that provide thought leadership in oral health care, uh, as well as educational and training content for DSO departments. So, you know, <clears throat> as these progress and you're thinking through, if you've got suggestions, thoughts, comments, feedback, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, this is meant to be an interactive experience and really hear from, from all of you. Uh, today, we're very, very grateful to have uh, large practice sales for helping us organize this presentation and to look at the invisible DSOs and their growth outlook for 2023. So I'd like to uh, quickly introduce our um, panelists. Uh, we have Chip Fickner, principal at Large Practice Sales. He is the co-founder of LPS, which completed over 600 million of practice transactions in 2022 with 31 IDSOs for clients in 29 states. He has built, bought, and sold multiple companies, both public and private, in a variety of industries for over 40 years and has been featured in numerous media outlets, including the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and CNBC. Uh, thank you, Chip, and welcome. And then also, uh, we have my good friend and uh, ADSO Executive Committee member, Mitch Olin, on the line. Uh, Mitch currently sits on several invisible DSO boards and was a founding member of the ADSO. Uh, he dedicated 28 years to building Dental Care Alliance. Uh, DCA is one of the largest IDSOs in the country with over 395 locations in 22 states. Uh, at Dental Care Alliance, Mitch served for 18 years as the COO, Chief Executive Officer for six years and Executive Chairman for four years. Prior to joining DCA, Mitch was Senior Vice President of Option Care, a publicly traded home infusion therapy organization with over 400 locations nationwide. And Mitch began his career at Ormco Corporation, holding various roles in sales and management over a 10-year period. Ormco uh, is the country's largest manufacturer and marketer of orthodontic appliances. So now that we've gotten our esteemed group on the line, I'm going to turn it over to both of you. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Chip, are you there? Yes, sir. I'm here. All Can right. you hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Thank you, Mitch. I apologize. Technical difficulties on my end. Well, I appreciate everybody joining us today. We have a very unique opportunity to speak with who I consider to be the godfather of the invisible DSO business. And we're hoping to get <laughs> Mitch to tell us about his journey over the last 30 plus years of building one of the largest uh, DSOs and invisible DSOs in the country. A uh, quick bit about us. Uh, obviously, we've done a lot of transactions recently, and this business is growing primarily because younger doctors are becoming more eager to partner with what we call invisible dental support organizations, and we'll talk about what they are. But Mitch, thank you for being here. I appreciate it because you are truly the expert and the innovator on this whole invisible DSO concept. And let's let's go to the next slide. So functionally, an invisible DSO is different from a dental support organization or a traditional dental support organization because they are functionally becoming silent partners with the doctors. They're not trying to homogenize the practice. They are investing in a practice by buying anywhere from 51 to 90 percent of the practice for cash up front. And the doctor retains ownership and continues to lead the practice under his brand, his strategy, and his team. And it really, it's structured and perceived by the doctor as a true partnership, not an acquisition. Um, and so that's really the primary difference where the doctor is retaining autonomy, retaining his brand, retaining his team. You know, Mitch, you might talk about your last 30 years of how you went from branded to an invisible DSO. Yeah, no, happy to. I mean, you know, we've evolved with the uh, the profession, the industry over the last 30 years. Uh, we originally were created to support the dental practices business side so that the dentists can take care of their patients and take care of the clinical side of things. Uh, that, that still is in the root, that's the core of our business. What has happened, Chip, was 
early on back in the 90s, we were you know, adding a lot of practices and it was primarily doctors in their, I would say late 50s to early 70s that were looking to monetize their practice and retire. Um, that, that evolved into what you just mentioned today, uh, where we have a lot more doctors in their 30s, 40s, and 50s looking to affiliate with a DSO or an IDSO in this case uh, to, uh, to be part of something bigger that is going to allow them to, uh, to still maintain some autonomy, but uh, have the, the benefits and the economies of scale that come along with being part of a larger en entity. What we did was over the last, uh, the, the last 30 years, we, we morphed from, we would uh, we'd buy a practice, we'd fold it into a brand in, or in the region, and uh, the doctor would transition out over the next three to five years. Um, what we found was over time, we, we had too much doctor turnover. Um, we, and what ended up happening was the doctors that were selling, looked to, they were younger and younger. So they were looking to stay on for a longer period of time. And they built a lot of goodwill in the practices that they had. And they wanted to maintain that goodwill. And, and we wanted to maintain our, our involvement in the practice. But to us, we wanted to also be transparent uh, and very, very uh, invisible, if you will, to the marketplace. So the, the other doctors in the community, the patients, uh, they didn't know that the doctor had sold and joined a larger entity and partnered with a larger entity to uh, to become some, you know, something that uh, uh, would allow them to uh, tap into our resources, but uh, to uh, minimize their exp their exposure and their risk. What we found as we were transitioning were the the partnership model uh, as it morphed was much more effective and productive and more profitable than the uh, than the DSO model. Um, we, we and it really started to attract a lot of uh, a lot of doctors that were interested in uh, getting the business side off their plate. Had no interest in retiring anytime soon. And um, and what what's happened over the last 10, 15 years is we we didn't do any deals that weren't a partnership. And, uh, and it's allowed for a more stable environment with our provider partners. It's allowed for a better. Um, um, uh, profitability in the practices, because no matter how you slice it, when somebody has some skin in the game, they look at the their practice differently than when they don't. Uh, I don't know the more recent statistics, but back when we were transitioning, our partnership offices were performing at three to 400 basis points better than our non-partnership offices. And that's still to this day, uh, you know, remains the same, that our partnership offices perform better than non-partnership offices, which we still have some from the legacy situations that we had from many years ago. I love that because that's how we've been able to attract younger doctors to partner with invisible DSO is because they don't have a three to five year time horizon. They have a 10 to 20 to 30 year time horizon. It's, it's very different. So uh, would you go to the next slide, please? So a, a lot of invisible DSOs versus DSOs is about perception. And so the reason I titled this as what's in the doctor's mind is it's not necessarily what the DSO or invisible DSO believes, it's about what the doctor believes. And as we have brought multiple clients into partnership with invisible DSO, it's been about a discussion of partnership and support, not about their practice becoming homogenized or compartmentalized into some corporate strategy uh, or some specific corporate model. Instead, the invisible DSOs are eager to partner with doctors of all different types and, and strategies, let's call it. I mean, I, I think there's one invisible DSO that has three different practices in the same building under three different brands that all target a different segment of the patient population. And I think that's fairly common. So what we believe attracts our clients, the younger doctors, uh, to these um, invisible DSOs is the fact that they're going to retain their autonomy and freedom, but they're going to give up the trauma and drama of the administrative functions of a practice. And we'll talk about what those are that they, they give up. But generally speaking, an invisible DSO is far more interested in paying a higher value for a practice in which the doctor is going to stick around for five, 10, or 20 years. They're, they're interested in a long-term partnership. Wouldn't you agree, Matt? Oh, definitely. I mean, you know, what we're seeing today is, and, uh, and you know, as my bio indicated, I sit on the board of a number of invisible DSOs. Uh, I'm also involved with some DSOs, and, uh, you know, there, there's a difference there. 
Um, the, the doctors are looking for a long-term partnership, a long-term relationship. Uh, many of the invisible DSOs have uh, joint venture opportunities where they will partner at the office level and others will, will allow the doctor to partner at the hold co level or the parent company uh, where the doctor rolls some of their proceeds into the parent company and some do both. Um, you know, these younger docs in their thirties and forties, they see the returns that, that are being made in the uh, private equity world. And what this also allows them to do if they partner in with the parent company is to take, you know, uh, take that opportunity to, uh, to, to get, uh, get those type of returns themselves over a period of two, three turns, which could take you know, 15 years, 20 years. And so they have that type of time horizon. Thanks, Mitch. Would you go to the next slide, please? You know, the, the interesting thing is each of the invisible DSOs are different. Each one provides different support services. Um, I like to talk about one of the invisible DSOs to which we have sold or partnered about a dozen practices. They are particularly good at digital marketing. And so our average client that we partnered with that group saw a 20% plus increase in production in the first 12 months after partnering with them. There are other groups that are exceptionally good at solving recruiting challenges. Uh, Mitch, I don't know what the latest is at Dental Care Alliance, but uh, back three years ago, y'all had a dozen, a dozen more people internally just focusing on recruiting, uh, whether it was associates, front desk, uh, assistance hygiene, et cetera. And those recruiting resources today, post COVID, are extraordinarily valuable. Uh, but there are different reasons, and all of them, they're, they're, you know, as Mitch told me once, I don't know, five or six years ago, if you've seen one invisible DSO, you've seen one invisible DSO. And that's a great quote. Uh, would you go to the next slide, please? So, again, each of these groups is different. Mitch, you might want to talk about what uh, your years at Dental Care Alliance, what they did. I think this lists a lot of the services and support that you provided, but I might have something here. Yeah, no, we, we evolved over the years um, and, uh, and, and to the point where we provide all the services listed on the, uh, uh, on the slide here. Um, you know, I think that uh, you know, some of the uh, invisible DSOs, as they scale up, they're able to provide more services. Uh, most of them have a goal of providing all these services. Some of them you know, choose not to, uh, which is fine. You know, and again, that, that goes back to the point of if you've seen one, you've seen one, uh, you, that uh, every, uh, every invisible DSO is, uh, is created a little bit differently. Um, you know, and, and it really boils down to what do you feel as a seller, uh, what, what needs need to be met to help you along to grow your practice in the most comprehensive and, uh, and efficient way possible. And there are gonna be some invisible DSOs that are gonna provide those services um, in much more detail and, uh, than, than others. Uh, but you know, what we have found is that for the most part, um, I've seen over the years that you know, the doctors really wanna shed themselves of the day-to-day -day business responsibilities and, uh, and, and just concentrate on the clinical care, the patient care, and, uh, and, and, and maximizing their time at the chair. Thanks, Matt. Would, would you go to the next slide, please? You know, I, I think this is probably one of the biggest misconceptions of doctors that we talk to. They believe that partnering with an invisible DSO will reduce their freedom, take away their uh, autonomy, and dictate who they hire, who they fire, uh, what supplies they have to use, tell them when they can take vacations or not. And that is just not the reality. The reality is... I think we lost For whatever reason. And, and their goal is not to try and change uh, the practice. Their goal is to provide support services that the doctor wants, not forcing the doctor to uh, conform to some uh, overall global model. Wouldn't you agree with that, Mitch? I mean, I know the number. Of yeah, no, I think we, it... we did the DSA. They were all different. 
yeah, if you if you think about it logically, you're you're in a partnership. Whether the 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 seller doc holds on to ten percent or forty nine percent, you still have a situation where they are a partner, and you do not want to alienate that partner, and you want them to have a chair, a seat at the table, to uh, to you know to to work on a consensus basis to grow the practice. Um, if you come in and start dictating things, whether it be on you know, the clinical side, which you can't, uh, or the non-clinical side, which you shouldn't, uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna alienate that doctor and put a wedge in that relationship. So from a logical standpoint, you wanna have that partnership be something that you, you sit down, you build a consensus and you execute on that uh, with the, you know, with a, with a game plan that you're aligned on. Yeah. And, and I, and I, I spend many hours talking to doctors about this because that's their biggest single concern. Part of the way we address that in our process is that once a doctor has chosen, we'll call them the, the one or two leading bidders for their practice or bidders for their partnership, we will put our clients on the phone with other doctors who have done transactions with the particular group that they're considering so that they can hear it doc to doc, nobody else on the phone. Okay, here's what happened. Here's what changed. Here's what didn't change. And our doctor clients, the prospects who are considering a particular BSO, um, get to ask the questions, okay, what changed? What didn't change? Are you glad you did it? Would you do it again? And we consider that to be a key part of the process because I think I think one of the reasons we have had success is all of our clients go into these transactions with their eyes wide open. Absolutely, some things are going to change, but uh, it's a lot better off when you understand what will change. Could you please go to the next slide? And, and to that, to that point, to that point, Chip, I would say that you know what, what my conversations in the past and even present, uh, you know, it's I prefer to use the word evolve versus change. Because if in fact you have a uh, you have a, a a doctor that doesn't sell to an invisible DSO or a DSO and stays independent on their own, things are going to change. They have to change. They have to evolve. And so you know the message is that you know this is an evolution, not a revolution. That you know the change that happens is measured to uh, to support the growth of the practice, to support the staff, and to support the patients. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a good way. Of of putting it because I think uh, doctors seem to think for some reason that the invisible DSOs or DSOs are not putting patients number one, when in reality, that's the basis of any successful invisible DSO is that patients are number one. If you don't take care of the patients, you don't have a business. And so you wouldn't have the large DSOs or invisible DSOs that we had if they weren't taking care of patients. And the dentistry is unique in that. If you do what's right for the patient, the 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 economics will fall into place because it's you know if it, you know what in, in within an invisible DSO or a DSO for that matter uh, you know there there are checks and balances to make sure that the providers within any environment are doing what's right for the patient and uh, and I think that's uh, that's something that a a seller should take comfort in knowing that uh, they're they're not going to be aligned with a group of doctors that don't have the best interest of the patient in mind. Yeah, and, and you know, in this business, you don't get to be big unless you have enthusiastic doctors that endorse the invisible DSO's support model, uh, and they're not treated well. I mean, uh, you you look at the big invisible DSO's, of which there are multiple ones with, you know, over three hundred practices. They didn't get to that size because they had unhappy doctors, or because they were telling their doctors how to provide patient care. Now, one of the things we look at when deciding whether a invisible DSO is a qualified partner for one of our clients is what's their growth rate. And so when you have an invisible DSO that's growing, it's basically a testimonial to the fact that the doctors are happy and that the patients are being cared for. It's a pretty straight line. Uh, you know, if you had unhappy doctors and you had unhappy patients, you would not have a growing invisible DSO. It's pretty simple. So, right. uh, you know, I, 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 when looking at the pre-registrant list for our event here today, Mitch, I um, saw that there are a number of invisible DSOs and DSOs on the registrant list. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the business development process, meaning how invisible DSOs attract new clients to their invisible DSO. And, and it's, it's an interesting dance. So there are 
They're invisible DSOs that uh, have very active outbound contacting of doctors. There are other invisible DSOs that utilize advisors like us to find great practices. But in, in either case, it's critical that the invisible DSO has a very well-defined uh, partnership strategy. And that partnership strategy has to be run by very sharp people if they want to win the best practices to join them. And to me, it all starts with whoever is head of business development, and that guy may have the chief development officer title or chief growth officer title. But those people are incredibly important if you're an invisible DSO trying to attract partners because they need to be responsive, they need to be eloquent, I would say they need <laughs> they, they need to have their act together. We, we run into many DSOs that have uh, chief development officers or business development executives uh, that are not really experienced in dental, uh, which is a shame because they need to be. And some of them will have BD executives who are not experienced in dentals, but they supplement themselves with a dentist who has joined the group. And we find that the most successful invisible DSOs, and keep in mind, some of these groups have grown from 40 practices to 500 practices in the last five years. You know, there are a couple that have grown from zero to 200 in the last three and a half years. And those, I believe, that were the most successful um, had not only a great BD team, but also included their doctors in the process. Now, that may have been their chief clinical officer, it may have been other doctors that had joined them, but doctors like to talk to doctors, and you have to include doctors in your process, in my opinion. Mitch, what do you think? Oh, definitely. I think you know, the earlier on you include a doctor in the process, I think the better off you are, uh, whether that be a chief clinical officer or a regional uh, uh, clinical officer. Uh, you know, somebody that 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 uh, that seller is going to be working with. Uh, in, uh, in some capacity going forward. You build those relationships early on. You allow them to connect and bond and, and, uh, and, and see philosophically that they're on the same page. Um, you know, while the due diligence, you, you also have the, uh, the clinical officer get involved in the due diligence of, uh, of making sure that it is a, a, uh, a practice that aligns with your goals with your treatment philosophies and protocols, and that the uh, the, the dentist has a similar approach to uh, to how to grow and uh, and uh, and survive in an ever changing environment. Yeah, it, it's it's really important that the invisible DSOs get their business development process right, and and one of the things that we we believe is critical to that process is response times. Uh, where if the doctor asks a question, we need to be able to get them an answer fast, not a week, but a day at the most. Um, the other thing that we're seeing today with some of the newer, uh, well-capitalized, but we'll call them less experienced invisible DSOs, is that they are making fantastical claims of the future upside value of the equity that the doctor will retain. And certainly we've seen multiple doctors, hundreds of doctors who have made three, four, five, and even 10 times their, their money on the retained equity portion. You know, to some degree, those kind of returns are uniform. This is not a miracle get rich quick scheme. And so one of the things that we are seeing with some of the newer, call them less credible invisible DSOs that may have lots of money, but they don't necessarily have a strategy and they're making extraordinary promises to doctors that, in my opinion, they will not be able to deliver on. So I think one of the important things for any group that's trying to build an individual DSO is to, is to be careful about what you're promising these doctors in the equity upside, uh, because who knows what we have in the future. Would you go to the that's next right. slide for a minute, please? That's right. It, Chip, if, I could just add, if I could just add to that, yeah, Chip, please. Yeah, I, yeah. I think that you know, I think that you know, any commitments that are made to doctors on what the upside could be from their hold co equity, 
uh, needs to be tempered. It's really, it's a diversification play. Uh, just like any financial advisor would tell you, I mean, you, know, you wanna be diversified in your portfolio to weather any ups and downs of the different components of your portfolio. And that's the way that, you know, that the doctors should look at. They've got, they might have a component in the hold co company. They have a component, maybe joint venture at the, uh, at the office level. They've been able to monetize some of their equity and take chips off the table and put it into stocks or bonds or real estate. And it's all, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it really boils down to what, um, you know, what, what I call a diversified portfolio and, uh, you know, betting on the, the best, the results that you can get in that such a diversified portfolio and not having the, you know, not, not counting on the home run from any one component. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, and I think that sort of leads to the topic of, of deal structure. Um, I don't think we've met an invisible DSO that we have done transactions with that wasn't creative in their structure development. Any invisible DSO that wants to partner with a great doctor is going to be very creative and flexible in how they structure that transaction. And the, the structures can vary all of the map and they're important from the tax consideration. They're important from what the doctor is interested in accomplishing. So last year, we had uh, a group of uh, pediatric dentists and orthos uh, that were all under 40. Uh, this was a $51 million transaction. These doctors were all very uh, bullish on their new partners for the upside. So they did a transaction where they got $26 million in cash and $25 million in equity in their new partner. That turned out to be a great deal for them because six months later, their partner recapitalized and the value of their equity doubled. Now, that unfortunately is a unicorn. That's not going to happen every day. But on the other end of the spectrum, we had a 59-year-old doctor who had four great ortho offices, and he was not in the chair much himself. And so he was was very adamant that he was there for three years, period, the end. And therefore, he would not be around to benefit from the gains in the equity that he might retain. So he was eager to get as much cash as possible. And in his transaction, it was a $42.5 million transaction, and he got 95% in the tank. He was not betting on the upside of the equity. He was very eager to get as much cash as possible. And, and the reason I put those two examples in there is because they're such a uh, dramatic end spectrum. Um, you know, the typical transaction that we see doctors in their, let's call it 50s, uh, is that they're going to get 70% cash and 30% equity. And that equity might be held at the practice level, the parent level, or a combination of both. Um, and we're seeing uh, a slight uh, divergence to more practice level equity because at practice level equity, the doctors are getting a percentage of the practice profits paid to them and doing monthly or quarterly. Um, but, you know, when you take practice level equity to some degree, you're, you're giving up or giving away a piece of the potential upside of a parent company. But the key is that they're all different and they're all custom. When an invisible DSO is eager for a particular doctor, uh, they can be very creative in how we can customize transactions to meet the doctor's goals and needs. Uh, last point on this slide, probably the most important point on this slide, is that earnouts, uh, which were functionally uh, popularized during COVID, are really important to both the doctor and the invisible DSO. An earnout basically gives the doctor upside in their purchase price based on their performance in the first 12 or 24, or sometimes 36 months after closing. So what that does is motivate the doctor to not sit home and figure out how to manage his new windfall of $9. It gives him an incentive to dig in, use his partner's resources, and grow his practice. And so those earnout components are valuable both for the doctor and for the invisible DSO. And fortunately, I think every transaction we've done in the last billion dollars of transactions has had an earnout component. Thank you, COVID. But they are really powerful for both the invisible DSO and the doctor. And Mitch, I know you guys have done that. I would guess that that has worked out well for you. Yeah, no, it has. I mean, I've you know, candidly, Chip, I've seen earnouts work. I've seen them not work. Uh, but you know, the majority of them do work. 
Uh, if you have the right uh, doctor with the right attitude and the right understanding of what an earnout is and how they can maximize the benefit of it, um, you know, but if they have the wrong attitude or they go in thinking that the earnout is just going to be another chunk of, uh, of, um, of compensation to them down the road without any effort on their part, uh, those have a tendency to fail. Uh, and then, then there, you know, they could be finger pointing at the end. But I, I, I've seen, you know, the majority of the earnouts do work. Just, you know, just need to be careful that it's with the right partner. Yep, I agree. And, and right partner is really what we spend a lot of our time coaching our clients on, is that you don't necessarily want the high bidder. You want the right partner. And it's not about the initial value. It's about the long-term relationship and the value. And what I always tell our doctors is this is not a one night stand. This is a marriage. You're going to live with your partner for at least the next five years and hopefully the next 10 or 20. And so you got to pick a group that you are comfortable with and that fits your values, vision, and goals. Uh, go to the next slide, if you would, please. Yeah. Another thing that we coach uh, invisible DSOs on is it is absolutely critical that you live up to your commitments. Whatever you commit to, you need to. You want to be known as the group that under promises and over delivers. There's there's one particular invisible DSO that we had uh, thirty transactions with in the last six years, and they are they are sticklers for if they say this deal steps and they'll line outline forty steps. If these deal steps are going to happen on this particular day, they bend over backwards to make sure it happens on that particular day. And because of that, they get some very loyal doctors. And, and I think invisible DSOs and DSOs, for that matter, need to understand that if you say something, it's not about whether you deliver today or not. It's about how these doctors in the closing process perceive you and their long-term relationship. If you do what you say you're going to do in what we call the engagement period, you're going to have a much happier doctor long-term, not just one year, but five or 10 years. And so when, when an invisible DSO is partnering with a doctor, they need to have a letter of intent that's very detailed, that talks about what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen. And you need to follow that timeline. And certainly, uh, if you go through the quality of earnings test, meaning the audit, and there is a reason to renegotiate the deal based on new information, uh, that's okay. But as a general rule, Trying to retrade these deals near closing gives a bad taste to the doctor. And you're not going to have a great long-term partner if you're retrading deals on the eve of closing. And, and I urge, and I know Mitch, y'all are great with this, or DCA was great with this. You got to use your doctors in all steps of the process, not just the initial uh, dating process, but in the in the post LOI engagement process, because doctors trust their peers. And when you use other doctors to assuage the concerns of the prospective partners, you're going to be happy. That's right. Let's go to the next slide. This is a question that I obviously get every day, which is are interest rates impacting values? The answer is. Not yet. Um, we're still getting record value for values for practices, primarily because there are so many new entrants into the invisible BSO game. You know, as I point out in one of my recent newsletters, there was over five billion dollars of new capital invested in invisible DSOs last quarter alone. So you have new capital coming in, which is offsetting the impacts of the invisible DSOs that are having credit issues or higher interest rates. And so last year was by far the highest value to achieve for our clients. Um, we did not do any transactions under seven times EBITDA, whereas in, let's call it 2018, many of our transactions were under seven times EBITDA. Our record transaction last year was at about 12.2 EBITDA, 12.2 times EBITDA. We just signed one yesterday at 12.5 times. So while you would think because of higher interest rates and because all invisible DSEOs use leverage as a part of the process, um, it's not true. Uh, because of the new groups that are coming in that are well capitalized, we're seeing values uh, at least as high as 22. We are not seeing any degradation 
in values. Mitch, you got any comments on that? Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think that, uh, you know, the values have maintained, although in, in the face of everybody's expectation that they are going to come down. Uh, and I think to your point, Chip, the reason they've, uh, they've been able to be maintained in the market is because of the new money that's flowing in. Uh, that said, you know, uh, you know I, I go back to my earlier point about, you know, if you've seen one invisible DSO, you've seen one invisible DSO and new money flowing into some of these startups, um, you know, means that there's a learning curve that has to, that they have to go through. So uh, I see the more established uh, IDSOs uh, with a more disciplined approach. Uh, but, um, you know, it's going to be it's going to be a competitive market for the foreseeable future because of all the money that's flowing in to, you know, to, per your point. Yep, I agree, I agree with you. And, and what we always counsel our clients is you need to look at not just the management of the invisible DSO, but the money behind it. You know, fortunately, you have some private equity groups and family offices that have built multiple invisible DSOs over the last 10 years. And they have monetized those with great gains to their doctors and to their investors. Uh, and so we always uh, are very careful in looking at the, we'll call them newer invisible DFOs, to understand the track record, not just of the management, but of the money behind it, because it matters. Well, let's go to the next slide. You know, one of the things that is important to an invisible DSO in their lifespan is how fast they grow. If you look at some of the great recapitalizations of the last two years, these are groups that had very rapid growth. So I'll, I'll use one example of a specialty group uh, where we sold them their first uh, new practice uh, after they had gotten initial capital from their initial recapitalization, and that was done in November of 17. And I think the practice that we partnered with them uh, was practice number 40. And today they're at about 540 practices. So they have added 500 practices in six years. Um, there are practices out there or invisible DSOs out there that have gone from an idea three and a half years ago to 250 practices today. And there are multiple examples of that. Uh, and growth adds value. And so when you look at a potential invisible DSO partner, you have to look at their growth rate, not only in acquisitions, but what have they been able to accomplish with the practices that they have partnered with? Have, have their support services been able to accelerate the internal and organic growth of those practices? And Mitch, you can talk a lot better about this than I can. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's you know, it, I've always said it's easy to buy or partner with practices. It's harder to run them and grow them and build them. And, you know, and, and, you know, going through a, a three recaps like I have in the past 10 years, uh, there's got to be a good organic growth story. And so, you know, that, that's why it's critical to partner with the right uh, doctors to begin with and to have a vision that you're aligned with on how to grow the business, how to grow the practice. And how you grow practice A is going to be a little bit different than how you grow practice B. In an invisible DSO, there, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of differences between the, uh, the, the sellers and the partners. And you have to have a playbook that you can modify uh, to uh, to be able to grow these practices because that is that is critical to the uh, the turn of the business and to get the types of returns that you want out of it. Fantastic. Well, Mitch, I really appreciate your time. I, I think uh, that we're going to have some interesting questions about this. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm happy to, to chime in here and, and hopefully ask uh, some questions that uh, either we've, we've pulled in here and I think some uh, some are coming in through the chat. And I just I'll remind everyone that um, you can use the Q&A function uh, to answer to ask any questions. I think there's some coming uh, also through the chat that is longer and I, I would like to read it for a second. So while I read this and um, and uh, try to um, just um, paraphrase it for you guys, maybe I just wanted to go back to the one thing, Chip, that you had said earlier um, about uh, IDSOs and their attractiveness to um, younger uh, doctors. What, could you just go into a little bit more of, of why are they so attractive to, to that audience? And Mitch, no, Yeah, but there are a couple of reasons. Number one, the younger doctors um, today are interested in focusing on patient care and, and dispersing 
the administrative minutia. I mean, it's becoming a lot more complicated to run a practice today than it was 10 years ago. Uh, regulation, rules, technology, et cetera. And so when a younger doctor can offload the administrative minutia to a partner, that's exciting to them. Uh, they have families. Uh, they're interested in, in maintaining their family time, not going home and doing payroll after working, you know, a 35 hour week of, of working in the mountain chair side. And so you're, you're finding younger doctors are, are looking at invisible DSOs as a mechanism to offload some of the administrative burden that they're carrying. Secondly, <clears throat> thanks to the multiple recapitalizations that have occurred in the last couple of years, the doctors are finding that the upside and the equity can be significantly higher than remaining in the bank. And, and, and that, that upside and the equity becomes particularly valuable when you can take a 10 or 20 year time horizon versus the old days of the doctor at 60, and I'm 63, so I can pick on us old people. Um, you know, when, when you have a time horizon of 20 years, you can see the value of that equity that you retain increase dramatically. And I don't mean by 10% a year, but we're talking five or 10 times the initial value of that equity over a period of time, if you choose the right partner. And so these doctors have the opportunity because they're younger and have practicing time horizon to create generational wealth, not just ordinary income taxed at 37% federal plus whatever your friendly state is taxing you. When you take equity, those gains are taxed until you ultimately uh, liquidate the, the equity, and then it's taxed at a 20% federal rate. So there's a lot of upside in the equity opportunities if you choose the right partner. Mitch, you could probably comment on yeah, no, the, the, I think you, you covered it well. The only other thing that I would say that's that's changed or shifted the uh, the, the marketplace to younger docs looking to partner with uh, invisible DSOs is the fact that the model is now more mature and the competition in the marketplace is more intense. So as somebody that is 35, 40 years old, they built a nice practice, but they see that there's, uh, there's a lot of movement towards uh, affiliation or, or partnering with a, an IDSO or, or a DSO, uh, they want to get under the tent because the, the marketplace to be successful, uh, the environment to be successful is changing dramatically. So if I can, if I could partner with an IDSO that's going to get me better rates for insurance, it's going to get me better rates on my supplies, that's going to have better benefits for my staff, uh, and I am able to monetize some of my equity today, and uh, and it's in an environment that is not the environment that that was uh, that we were you know that the marketplace was was led to believe 10, 20 years ago that we were the devil reincarnated. They realize today that that's not the case. That there are a lot of great plays out there for them to be a part of something larger, monetize their equity, still be you know uh, in, enhance their competitive uh, positioning, and uh, still be in control of their practice going forward. Yeah, that's a very good point, Mitch. The, the, the world has changed to where, let's go back 10 years, 15 years, the the typical DSO affiliation with a doctor is very much a command and control. Here's our four-inch thick binder. These are the policies and procedures you need to, to follow. Whereas as the growth of the invisible DSO model has evolved, uh, they're not trying to tell the doctors what to do. Um, and, and it's all about autonomy freedom. You know, they're getting to choose who they hire, who they fire, who they pay, what procedures they do or not. And, and you're right, that uh, I forgot about that. That is that is a huge part of the chain. I appreciate uh, both of those answers there. I'm going to try to bucket these because there's a lot of good questions coming through the chat and Q&A. If we don't get to all of them, I promise that um, we will uh, we will look to, re to review and get some answers afterwards. Um, let's maybe stick on the financing and the um, the valuation and, and the value to uh, the doctor partners. Um, I think I want to get to a question of on the exit strategy, but maybe just if we could talk to um, some of the practice where you have doctors that are coming in that are looking for a relationship. And I'm, I'm reading one here from the, the chat here that was aimed aim for you, Mitch. So if you hadn't had a chance to read this, I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit, but um, uh, looking at IDSOs and, and their interest in in having a closer relationship with the patient um, and the commercial financing partner. So where 
obviously we're talking relationships with the doctors, but um, you from an IDSO perspective also having um, broader relationships with the with the other um, entities involved. Um, what is that? What does that look like? How how are you leveraging that, or um, how are you trying to um, kind of get into those relationships when you're also trying to think about well the doctors and we want to make sure that they are able to keep these relationships as well. Well, if I, if I understand the question correctly, you're talking about the maybe third party financing for patients, or um, is is that is that what the the question is? It's it is it is getting to that. Yeah. Well, I, I think you know any any. Um, any invisible DSO should be able to have those relationships in place that they could bring to their doctors. Uh, it is a, you know, and, and, and hopefully a relationship with a financing partner that's going to bring them, you know, uh, uh, terms and uh, um, benefits that are going to be better than they can achieve on their own. Um, the, those, those, those are critical in today's environment, having a, a, f- a financing arm for a, uh, for the patients to be able to accept Care, especially as we're in a uh, an inflationary environment, uh, you know, uh, the, and and I think that any um, you know any uh, uh, effective IDSO should have the uh, those 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 systems in place where they can roll that out to their partners. Appreciate that, Chip. Anything to add there? No, it's, you know, patient financing is an interesting concept. And there are some groups that are going to internal patient financing. It'll be interesting to see how that works out. All right. Um, how about, I appreciate that. How about uh, kind of on the way out, uh, this is a, another question in the in the chat here. Um, we're, we're talking balanced relationships, right? And how are, how are you guys, um, maybe we'll go to Mitch first again. Uh, how are you balancing a desire for a continued partnership when some doctors are looking to exit through a transaction? And the question specifically is, are you seeing this meaningfully affect multiples? Well, if some doctors are willing to, you know, if they're looking to, to exit through a transaction, um, you know, they, they might or might not be the right partner for your your respective IDSO. Uh, you know, I mean, I know there, there are IDSOs that won't talk to anybody that don't have at least a 10-year horizon. Uh, or a five-year horizon. Um, if if somebody is looking to exit, there there are going to be buyers out there for them. But you know, if, if it doesn't fit your the parameters of what you're looking for to grow your IDSO, then you should steer clear of it and not just go after it because it's a, a practice for sale. Uh, you know, and, and I think that you know, in the due diligence, that all has to be vetted out. And you know, I think having a you know having a, a partnership model where the doctor still has skin in the game usually vets out that that seller type. Uh, right out of the gates because they want as much off the table as possible and uh, and they want to slow down as quickly as possible and uh, and if you're going to have if you're going to get into a partnership with somebody like that there should be some uh, some you know verbiage about succession planning uh, and some discussion around that and how they are going to be able to uh, uh, bring in associates or new partners to uh, uh, to take over for the partner that wants to leave in a couple of years. Yeah, it, it, and we look at it very similarly in that if a doctor comes to me and says, hey, I'm, I'm a single doc rex, I'm done in a year, I tell them I can't help them. The invisible DSOs are not interested in short-term exits. They're interested in long-term partnerships. Now, if it's a multi-doc practice where you have five doctors and one of the doctors wants to retire at closing, that's okay. But when you have a, a single or one or two doctors, um it's just not an appropriate transaction for an invisible DSO. So we will politely tell the doctor that we are not the right guys to help them. Doesn't mean they don't have a practice that's sellable. It's just not sellable in a typical invisible DSO relationship transaction. It, it, it's a different animal. Um, so it's the, the, the invisible DSOs are looking for partners that have a relatively long term horizon. And frankly, what I tell doctors that are over 55, your practice value, if you have a large practice, is going down in value every single day because of your age. And that's that's partially driven by the fact that the invisible DSOs today can choose to partner with doctors in their 30s and 40s. And therefore, if they can partner with doctors in their 30s and 40s, they're going to not choose to partner with doctors in their late 50s and 60s. And that has been a big change in the last 
uh, well, let's call it 36 months since COVID. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a, I'll be honest, I'm newer to this uh, uh, industry and this, this discussion, uh, and I'm, I'm thankful to, to be a part of it. And this is really great insight. Um, I'm looking forward to um, discussing this more and, and everyone who's on here with everyone at the summit in, in a few weeks here. We've got two minutes left, and I really appreciate you guys, um, everyone who's audience uh, who, who is around here and, uh, and, and Chip and Mitch as well for sticking around. Maybe one last question, and I'll give it back to both of you guys just to kind of wrap up uh, maybe a final thought. Um, more on the rapid fire, uh, in an IDSO model, who, who's making the marketing decisions? Is it the doctor or the IDSO? Well, do you, do you want me to take that, Chip? Yeah, yeah well, please. Yeah, I, I, it's, a, it's a collaborative decision. Um, you know, I think that, and, and I say that based on my experience. I mean, there, there could be IDSOs that say, Look, this is the way that you know that uh, that we've done this. This is the this is the way that we like to do it. But it's a collaborative decision. Um, you know, from a marketing standpoint, uh, I think there's 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 marketing vehicles that have certainly the the uh, the statistics prove out that uh, the data proves out that it's a much better vehicle to market uh, you know digitally than in yellow pages or newspapers. Uh, if you got a doctor that's still you know really. Uh, uh, committed to doing some of the old marketing approaches. I mean, you know, historically, what I what I would do is I would I would say, well, let's let's try your way, let's try our way, and uh, and see what works, and then and then we can uh, we we can you know we can move forward together with with knowledge and data to uh, to build our marketing campaigns around. But uh, you know, I mean, everybody has a little bit different approach on how they're you know how they're approaching marketing based on the type of the practice, based on the payer mix based on the specialty, if it's a specialty group, um, you know, I mean, so it's, it's, it's very much a, uh, an IDSO independent decision uh, uh, from group to group as to how they, uh, how they approach marketing. I thought you were going to say that. I, 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 would, I, I would agree with that. It, it really is collaborative and, and it's something you discuss before you get married, right? It's like, are we going to have kids or are we not going to have kids? Um, it, it, it's one of the key, how are we going to do business together on a go forward basis that drives the partner that you choose? You know, our typical client will have six to 12 different partners to choose from, and each one's going to be different. And so those, that marketing is one of the topics you're going to have early on, long before you get engaged. Well, um, Chip, I want to pat and, and thank you guys. And I, there's some final kind of thoughts coming through here. I, I will share uh, contact information that the slides here are, are uh, as well part of the, the um, recording. And so I appreciate everybody that might want to continue a conversation afterwards. I think that would be, is that, I'm going to speak for you guys, Chip and Mitch, but that's okay. Please. Happy to have anybody email me. I, I, I live on email and love to answer questions. I'm an educator. Heading, heading as we head out of here and uh, and and get to the top of the hour, and and we've got the summit coming up in a month, and and um, we're getting out of the winter here. How um anything to wrap up uh, this conversation of what you see moving forward, um, Chip? Yeah, I, I think doctors are beginning to acknowledge that change is coming. Um, you may not like it, but the reality is that every doctor on this call or every doctor in the country is ultimately going to either join an invisible DSO or compete with many of them. I like it. I, I, um, I appreciate the, the thoughts and uh, the perspective and the transparency. And um, th this was a really great hour. And thank you, everyone, for, for joining us here. So, um, Mitch, Chip, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. Have a great rest of your day.